Dr. Doug Padden-Jones is a professor of nutrition and metabolism, a senior fellow in the UTMB Seeley Center on Aging, and director of our university's Physical Activity and Functional Recovery Translational Research Laboratory. He has published numerous manuscripts, book chapters, and review papers on topics including the muscle loss that occurs with aging, sarcopenia, protein metabolism, and the medical impact of physical inactivity. He has conducted several NIH and NASA National Space Biomedical Research Institute-supported bed rest studies, including studies investigating the effects of artificial gravity and amino acid supplementation on muscle protein metabolism. Dr. Padden Jones has served on the planning committee for the Institute of Medicine workshop on nutrition and healthy aging in the community and is currently a scientific advisory board member for several groups, including the National Dairy Council and the American Egg Board. Yeah, first, I just want to echo, here are my disclosures, I want to echo what Heather mentioned earlier, uh, and that's a big thanks to the, the checkoff for, for funding the, the types of research that ultimately influence practice. It's becoming harder and harder to, to do these types of nutrition related studies, uh, and the checkoff system is, is really one of the only opportunities that we can address these, these practical questions and get answers that apply almost immediately to, to the real world. Now, I, I like to start these sorts of talks by giving you my, uh, my idea of how my research program works and how I frame this whole idea of protecting muscle and function uh, as we age. Now, we know that there's a, a host of, of factors that can accelerate the, the loss of muscle and function as we age. But when it comes down to protecting muscle health, there's really only three options available to us. You know, we can have the best designed exercise rehabilitation regime. We can get pharmacologic drug support. But when you, when you think about it, it, it's really nutrition or specifically protein that represents that, that fundamental element or that keystone that has to be in place for any other intervention to, to work efficiently or optimally. Okay. All right, so we're going to touch on a few of the similar topics. We'll try and change the, the presentation, the direction a little bit. So how much protein you know, do we need versus desire? Now, this, this study here, we conducted it about 10 years ago. And prior to this, when we did these muscle metabolism type studies with the muscle biopsies and the infusions, we typically gave our, our volunteers uh, a cocktail of all the individual amino acids mixed up together. Very effective for, for building, repairing muscle, but it tastes dreadful. So it truly was proof of principle, proof of concept. This study was really the first to ask the, the, the simple question, well, what if we got a, a group of young and older adults and we gave them an actual high quality protein food? And we did just that. We brought them into our clinical research center here, young, older adults. <clears throat> Uh, just for a point of clarity, the, the younger folks here, they were about 30 years of age, and our older cohort was, was about 70 years of age. We brought them in, and we do the, the muscle biopsies and all those studies you really don't want to volunteer for. And, and first, you can, we measured muscle protein synthesis, the potential for muscle growth and repair, while they were fasting. So this is the, the, the bar there, the fasting one, is all of us before we had anything to eat this morning, before we did any activity. And right away, it was kind of good news for, for our older adults. There was no inherent basal impairment in muscle protein synthesis. Now, the intervention we gave was beef, lean beef. We gave them a four-ounce serving of, of beef. And four ounces of, of beef, or you could substitute chicken or fish conceptually, contains about 30 grams of, of protein. So that's where that magic number sort of started. Single meal and we measured the, ability, the muscle protein synthetic response to that single meal. And it was, it was robust. It was a, about a 50% improvement, which is not bad. That's not dissimilar to what we see with whey protein or a lot of these supplements. But the, the thing to, to circle and make note of was that it was similar in both our younger and older populations. Now, that, that's really encouraging. And to me, that suggests that aging doesn't necessarily impair our ability to take real food and use it to, to build and repair muscle, okay? 
Now, we wanted to do a, a follow-up to, to this study. And, and the, the, the standard joke that I use here is that I'm an Australian living in Texas and my immigration documents require me to eat at the Outback Steakhouse three times a week or I'll be deported. <laughs> uh, so we wanted to do this follow-up study, a dose response of sorts. So if, if we get a 50% increase in protein synthesis with four ounces, what if we gave them an a increased serving size that was representative of what we're eating at uh, restaurants? So we, we did. We gave them a 12-ounce portion, 90 grams of protein, thinking that if we saw an extra bump in protein synthesis, good, but you know, we'd have to balance that with the extra energy. We, we are getting fatter as a society. Here's the, here's the result. Yeah, sometimes when you don't get a difference in, in an outcome, it's disappointing. I, I don't think this is. I, I think this has a, a powerful message of, of moderation. The fact that we saw no in additional improvement in these folks' ability to build and repair muscle synthesis, to me suggests that somewhere around 30, give or take, it's, not, it's a starting point, Around 30 represents a, a ceiling effect or, or the maximum amount that we can take in in a single meal and, and use it to, to build and repair tissue. Now, this, this has a lot of, and if you're thinking ahead, this has a lot of application, implication for how we distribute protein across the day, how much we're consuming at specific meals. Uh, put 12 ounces of beef in context, 90 grams of protein. For someone who weighs about 75 kilos, a small child in Texas, that's, <laughs> I joke because I care. Uh, uh, that, that single meal for about a 75 kilo uh, individual would be about 50% well, more than the RDA, 1.2. So you're, you're greatly exceeding the, the RDA minimum in a single meal, but is the muscle actually using what you're consuming? Now, I'll, I'll touch upon exercise. Again, this, this follows on from the, the earlier work. This is the group that just had the, the, the protein meal, and it's a contrived research setting. Yeah, they're, they're lying in a hospital bed, and they've got IVs in. We're taking muscle biopsies. So to make it just a little bit more practical, we got our folks to do a bout of leg extension exercise. Now, it's not as strenuous as the stuff that, that Stu does, training-wise, but it was a bout of leg extension about four sets of 10 repetitions, not, not crazy intense, but we had it close to when they consumed the, the, the protein meal. And again, this, this was encouraging. We had a, we, lots of people have demonstrated this, but not initially with real food. Here we've shown a synergy, in this case it was kind of additive, effect of protein plus exercise. And again, the most encouraging thing here was that it was similar between our younger and older participants. Now, whenever you're looking at these sorts of studies, you have to realize a little bit about the design. To qualify for a lot of the studies that you know, we've talked about today, you have to be free from a lot of common diseases. So this isn't a, a, a typical sampling of the, of the population. Look at these studies, though, as, as kind of a best case scenario of, of what's possible. Uh, and I think that's you know, the potential to be able to respond to both nutrition and moderate physical activity as we age is, is tremendously important okay, and encouraging. Okay, so let's take it in the other direction. Our lab, lots of labs will, will broadly agree that if you give most populations a moderate amount of protein in a, in a single meal, they'll, they'll do quite well. Uh, but what if you've got a group who, who can't or, or won't consume much protein in a meal? Now, for, for younger folks, again, this has been touched on, if you say halve the amount of protein, you go from 30 to 15, you effectively halve muscle protein synthesis. It's kind of a linear decrease. And that's not so important for young, healthy adults. Here's, here's a problem, though. Healthy, older adults, kind of best case, if you go from about 30 grams of protein in a single meal down to 15, 10, that their ability to build muscle in response to that, that smaller meal is, is compromised. Now, uh, this is, we call this anabolic resistance. You're, you're resistant to the normal anabolic stimulatory properties of food. And this is, this is a problem. I'll talk about sarcopenia, the loss of muscle mass with, with age in a moment. But yeah, nutrition is a practical science. So when you're reading our papers, uh, put it in context of what people eat. Uh, and again, this has been touched on, but 
I, I think really until the last few years, if you spoke to most physicians and a lot of dietitians or nutritionists and you said, look, this morning I had some, some fruit uh, and an egg and a glass of milk, they'd, they'd probably say, well, you know, egg, milk, two high quality proteins, you know, good job. But when you start to look at the gram amount, you know, an egg might be six, seven grams, glass of milk, you know, around about the same, about eight. Maybe you've got 14 or 15 grams. Now, for, for a young, healthy adult, modest ability to use that amount of protein to build muscle. But for, for an older adult, it doesn't do nothing, but it falls quite a way below the, the maximum potential for, for building and repairing muscle. Okay. Now, uh, a lot of you have, have already seen this. So a lot of this data led us to, to think about what are we actually consuming as a society uh, and are we efficiently using the, the energy and the protein that's available to us? So Heather showed you the, the NHANES data. And this is a kind of a cartoon representation. And the concept here is that yeah, breakfast, for most of us, is a really heavily carbohydrate-dominated meal. We, we tend to choose the breakfast cereals, the bread products. You might have had oatmeal, which is great on several levels, but... Oats have a little bit of protein, milk, the rest. 10 grams in that meal, say. 10 grams falls quite a way below that, that maximum or optimum potential. Lunch is variable. Uh, for a lot of us, dinner ends up being this protein festival where we're getting you know, a lot of energy and protein. So the average American has uh, consumes about 88 grams of protein per day. And that, that slides in both directions depending on age. But there's a lot of protein available to us. So if you're following this sort of pattern, consuming 90 grams, but your, your muscle is only able to use somewhere around 30 grams in a single meal, uh, is this the most efficient approach? Or is this the, you know, the well often cited uh, overfed but undernourished syndrome? So it, you know, it's not simple math like this, but I think the concept bears investigation. The human body has a, a very limited capacity to store excess protein from a single meal and, and effectively use it later on that day. You know, we're not pythons. So you know, Stu touched upon the muscle protein synthesis response. Building muscle in response to protein ingestion is absolutely meal specific and it's limited in a, in a window. And this has a lot of application for, for plant-based or vegetarian diets combining to protein sources. You can't consume one type of protein at breakfast that's lacking in amino acid, have another complementary protein at dinner, and expect those two to mingle because the responses are separate. They, they don't overlap. Okay. All right. So here's kind of how we're currently eating, and, and here's the next obvious slide. So for a lot of us, we're not just talking about the blunt addition of extra protein although I do agree with Heather's assertion that if you target breakfast, a lot of the other meals will tend to fall into place. But uh, yeah, the, the broader concept here is not bluntly adding extra protein, but trying to maximise the amount that's available to us. And that has a lot of application for just weight management and general dietary practices. So this concept here is trying to get establish a dietary framework with a moderate amount of high-quality proteins three times a day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, where you're getting closer to that maximum or optimum potential for, for building muscle. And, and we'd hope that over months, almost years, that could translate into the protection of, of muscle mass. Now, there's a, there's a lot of research coming out. Stu's done some. There's a, a group uh, just up the road from him and uh, McGill, Stephanie Chevalier, who's looked at this in, in older populations. So I might have to retire these data, but it's yeah, people are starting to do the long-term studies. Some of them are successful, some of them not. But putting exercise into this, really important. We, we're not just creatures who eat most of the time. Uh, if you think about your own exercise practices, you, know, you might have exercised this morning, walked on the seawall or did some weight training, and that's got benefits in and of itself. Yeah, great. But if you're a, a breakfast skipper and that's when you exercise, you, you might have missed an opportunity to get that additive or synergistic protein plus exercise effect. Doesn't probably doesn't really matter for most of us, but if you're really trying to hold on to muscle mass as you age or you're in a clinical setting, which, which Ellen is going to talk about next, 
you might have missed the only opportunity that day to get any significant muscle growth and repair. Okay? But by adopting this basic framework where you're getting the amino acids, the protein in at regular intervals, it doesn't really matter when the exercise occurs, exercise rehabilitation, you've always got that protein to support it. Uh, and we can talk more about that in the discussion. You know, Marie talked about the timing and it's not good nutrition if it's on your shoes, pre-exercise and whatnot. But I think this is a really good starting point for the 99% of us that are regular people and are not you know, Olympic caliber or high, high caliber athletes. Now here's the actual study. So this was published just last year, pretty much exactly what I showed you. We took one group and put them on the typical sort of American skewed diet, Cheerios, entire chicken. And the other group was yeah, 30, 30, 30. And, and we do the muscle protein synthesis evaluations over, over 24 hours. The only thing that changed was the distribution of protein. The energy was the same. We kept carbohydrate the same in this case and manipulated fat. And the, the results were, were really you know, visually quite impressive. A 25% improvement in muscle protein synthesis just by rearranging how you consume protein. Now, that, that visually that looks great, but again, put it in the context of muscle outcomes. That 25% difference is not going to manifest into a change in, in you know, observable change in muscle mass over you know, a two, three month period. This is sort of a habitual lifestyle change. Oh, and uh, the, the folks that did this study were sort of young to middle age, 30 to 40. And I, I spoke earlier, if an older adult has a sort of a limited ability to respond to those smaller protein meals, so in the skewed condition, you know, 10 grams at breakfast, if we repeated this in an older population, like Stu said, I think we might even see a, a widening of the, the gap, highlighting the importance, potential importance of getting protein at each meal as we age. All right, so, so let's talk about muscle loss, aging, and uh, protecting it. Now, there's been a lot of effort over the last several years defining sarcopenia, coming up with uh, models. And, and pretty much everyone agrees on, on the basic definition that, that sarcopenia is an insidious, progressive loss of muscle mass starting kind of in your 40s. And you, you'll lose about a little bit less than 1% of your muscle mass per year. So it really sneaks up on you. Uh, and importantly, everyone's recognized that it's not just about muscle, there's a function component. So as you lose the muscle, you lose functional capacity, strength, endurance. And, and typically, when someone talks about sarcopenia, they, they throw up this, this figure. And, and again, it's, it's easily identifiable. We can all see this gradual progression of muscle loss as we age, but this doesn't help the, the clinician or the individual looking at trying to protect muscle health. This doesn't describe the common trajectory for, for most individuals. When you look at this, really the only option you've got is adopting a health, uh, basically a lifestyle change to try and flatten that curve out. But this doesn't turn an average healthy 40-year-old into a frail 70-year-old. What happens much more frequently is this, uh, catabolic crises, where you might be going along perfectly well uh, and, and you tear a knee ligament. And, and I'll show you what happens. You, you, if you're hospitalized, physically inactive, you can lose big chunks of muscle really quickly. And then your limited rehab, you're back on the trajectory. Another catabolic crisis later. And it's these periods that I think really cause a lot of the muscle function loss, but, but more importantly, give us a, a target for interventions, activity, pharmacology, and, and nutrition. So let, let me show you. Now, it's, it's a sad truism that uh, bed rest is a de facto treatment. You know, we, we talk about our hospitals, we characterize them by the number of beds that we have. And this was a, a study, some folks here, uh, our dean and uh, some other folks in the School of Health Professions did. And in most institutions replicated it, they'd see the same results. Uh, these guys simply put pedometers, accelerometers on our patients who are an inpatient uh, in our acute care for elders unit and just monitored the number of steps they took over about a four-day inpatient period. And, and it was horrifying. 95% uh, of the time that our folks were an inpatient, they were completely inactive, bed rest. The 5% the of the time that they weren't inactive, 
It was 15 steps a minute. That's not much. They were shuffling to the bathroom or maybe getting physical therapy. So this is the, you know, the common image of, of the clinical inactive patient. But if, if we think about what's happening inside the muscle due to, to inactivity, we, we can broaden it. Uh, <laughs> And, and uh, you know, I hope Stu brings up his, uh, his study where he took some healthy adults and he just reduced the number of steps that they took down to about 1,500 or so. And he's, he's gonna, he'll show similar results to what I'm about to, to show you. So sedentary muscle responds kind of similarly. Uh, and you, know, you can take it to the immobilization extreme, someone who's had a, a limb immobilized. Everyone has seen the rapid loss of muscle that occurs in, in that inactivity model. So in terms of targets, we've got a, quite a broad area to, to look at. All right, so here's, here's a host of, of studies where we're looking at the effects of inactivity on, on muscle mass. Now, this, this first one was kind of fun. It was a, a NASA-sponsored study, and NASA is interested in what happens when there's no gravity to, to load the, the muscles. And it costs you know, $35,000 a minute to exercise in space, so it's not, not practical, pretty high gym fees. So to, yeah, so to mimic it, we, we put people on, on bed rest, which just so happens to be how we kind of manage our, our patient populations. So we have overlap here. Now, these folks, we, we took a host of measures, the biopsies, all of these other outcomes. This is just a, a DEXA scan for osteoporosis, but you can measure muscle body composition. Over the 28 days that our, these young, healthy adults, pillow noughts, we call them, they, they lost about a pound of, of Mass muscle from the from the legs. So these DEXA scans are from the, the hips down. That's a reasonable amount of muscle, but it's not clinically relevant. So with uh, Bob Wolf and Bill Evans and a few other folks, we brought some older adults. Uh, again, these were, were about 70 years of age, and we put them on bed rest for 10 days, which is a, a little bit closer to the typical length of stay for, for a few conditions. Now, we really weren't sure what to, what to expect. You know, Marie and the sports dietitians can tell you, if you've got someone who's strength trained or really well endurance trained and you stop them training, you know, detrain model, they, they lose their fitness at a, at a much faster rate than I would. They're not going to get to my level. <laughs> but the initial rate of loss is, is going to be faster. So we, we thought by that analogy, maybe the younger folks are more like athletes, maybe the older folks are more habitually sedentary. So maybe putting these older folks on bed rest, not that much of a departure from normal, maybe nothing will happen. Yeah, no. That, that, that's pretty horrifying. In, in 10 days, they lost two to three times as much muscle. Okay, And that, that was despite receiving about 0.9 to 1 grams protein per kilo. So they exceeded the RDA, which is, is probably wildly optimistic for, for most patient populations. Okay, now we, we spoke a little bit about defining the age groups for, for research, and, and it is a little bit arbitrary. So typically we start recruiting an adult population, uh, 18, 20, and then we stop at 40, and then we'll call them young. And then for research purposes, we start recruiting again at 65, because it's a Medicare mandated age, uh, up to about 80, and we'll call them older. This, this middle-aged demographic is, is really under, underrepresented in, in research. Now, we just finished uh, uh, another NASA study looking at uh, uh, middle-aged adults. So the, the average age of the astronaut core is uh, approaching 50, kind of skewed by John Glenn, who's like 117. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so we wanted to see, well, what's the effect on middle-aged muscle if we expose them to bed rest? And this was 14 days. Now, before we started them, before bed rest, this is me and Stu, they, they looked kind of like their younger counterparts. There, there was no muscle loss. That Strength-wise, they were just like their younger peers. So they, they were healthy. And honestly, I thought for all the outcomes, they would fall somewhere in between. You can guess, right? Yeah. So yeah, they lost muscle. As soon as we ex exposed them to the, the catabolic stress of simple inactivity, they lost muscle just as quickly as their parents would. Now, that, that's kind of horrifying, but it's a bit of a wake-up message, and it does blur the lines between these artificial age group distinctions in research. That The nice thing, I think, about this, <laughs> one of the silver linings with this amount of muscle mass, is that it does pair nicely with the osteoporosis message 
that's been really drummed into us, you know, protecting bone health, you need to think about it when you're a young adult. I don't think it's different for, for muscle. You, know, you can be going along quite well at simple stress and you can lose muscle hand over fist. And, and as I said before, this is a best case scenario. Okay. Now, I don't often do this, but I, I think you, know, you can look at uh, figures and you can see look, it's pretty dramatic. Thank you to the Sullivan family for donating this uh, portion of the presentation. <laughs> that's, that's about, that's a little bit less than two pounds a kilo of, of muscle. So that's how much muscle our, our older and middle-aged guys are losing from their legs. Uh, and it, it all happened in about seven days. So in a, in a week, they're losing this much tissue. So Dr. Asmussen has got an exercise training study going on right now with uh, Tatiana, where they're training older adults, resistance training them hard for 12 weeks. And a lot of them would be really pleased to, to put on a kilo, two pounds of muscle in their legs after working out you know, three or four times a week for 12 weeks. We can lose it in, in seven days. And, and that should really inform where we direct our, our healthcare dollars and, and resources, okay? Startlingly fast. I'll use that again in a moment. <clears throat> so that's, that's the best case. Uh, uh, Ellen is going to talk about how this translates into clinical populations. So I'll, I'll just put this up here and show that when you add on clinical stress, so this was a group with community-acquired pneumonia. So they were bedridden, they were older, they, they were sick, and they weren't eating particularly well. In three or four days, they're, they're losing that, that big chunk of muscle. So when you hear about uh, an older adult who fractures a hip, 70% don't get out of bed again. Yeah, some of it's due to the trauma, but you've got to believe a lot of it is due to this catastrophic loss of muscle. For, for older adults and our patients, this much muscle is getting about 15% of their total leg mass. That's really difficult to, to recover from. Okay, so protecting muscle. Uh, now, leucine's been, been mentioned, so I'll, I'll talk about a few of the, you know, how it could be applied uh, and perhaps comment practically on are the benefits overstated or who could actually use it to, to, to good effect. Now, this, this was the middle age group that I just showed you, middle-aged guys, 14 days of bed rest. We measured a whole host of function outcomes, strength. So this first one was knee extension endurance. 20 reps of leg extension, and we measured the fatigue curve. Red group was uh, leucine uh, control. So simply by providing, it was, it was about four grams of leucine, about a teaspoon, a big teaspoon. We added it to yogurt in the morning, orange juice at, at lunchtime, hit it something at dinner. So not much, but just providing a little bit of leucine, which is you know a branch chain amino acid building block of protein. You got to say that first. Now leucine is is kind of unique among the, the amino acids. It, it also serves as a, a trigger for, for turning on that, that metabolic machinery that starts up muscle protein synthesis. Um, and we can talk more about that in, in, in the panel. But simply providing that anabolic support through leucine, protected knee extension endurance, uh, a VO2 max test, endurance capacity, uh, and pretty much every strength measure that we had. No activity, just nutrition support pretty encouraging. If we can get a clinical population and get them to hold on to just a little bit more muscle mass and function, that, that, you know, we hope that that would influence recovery and 30-day readmission rates and all those other metrics that are, that are driving healthcare. Okay, so here's where it gets a little bit more ba balanced. So we did a DEXA scan halfway through on day seven in these middle-aged guys. And initially, well, the first thing here, you can see that the the group in red, the control group, bed rest alone, by seven days they'd already lost all the muscle, pretty much all the muscle that they were going to. So the, 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 muscle, loss happen, the muscle loss happens really quick. Halfway through, the leucine seemed to be having a protective effect. It's not completely preventing the loss of muscle, but it's reducing the loss. But when we repeated the scan after seven days, after 14 days, it had kind of given up. Now, okay, disappointing, but I think it's unrealistic to think of something like simple nutrition to be able to chronically rescue 
muscle from a period of inactivity. But the way I like to think about it is that it's uh, something like a leaky life preserver. It'll help keep that metabolic machinery turning over for a relatively short period of time, but there's a limit. Now, a little bit disappointing, but practically most of our patients are admitted for about seven days or less. So that's one of those targeted opportunities where you could apply something like leucine and have it you know, potentially work. All right, so, so how is this, this relevant? Now, you, you can go out and buy it. it. It's pretty expensive and it tastes dreadful. Uh, or you can find it in, in a lot of high quality foods. Uh, whey protein isolate is, has the highest, uh, but you can get plenty in, in uh, beef and other types of, of protein. What I want to highlight, highlight here is with some of the plant-based proteins, we've mentioned it before, to, to get three grams of leucine, you know, that, that leucine trigger. Uh, the, the meal we had for, for lunch with the skewer, that was about four ounces of beef, 30 grams of protein. That'll have about three, three grams of leucine in it. You know, well done. You can have a uh, you know, typical scoop of uh, whey protein. That's about 20, 30 grams of protein, more than enough leucine. Here's, here's where it gets tricky, and I'll, I'll mention this again in a moment. This guy, collagen. Lots of companies are selling protein using that the protein is good message. To, to get three grams of leucine, you'd need about seven scoops. If I go 125 grams of, of collagen protein to get the leucine. Uh, but if you're following the protein quality metrics, PDCAS or DIAS, a few of those methods that we characterize protein, you can eat 125 grams of, of collagen, but its protein quality score will still be zero. It, it doesn't have tryptophan, one of the essential amino acids. You won't build muscle if you don't have all of the essential amino acids. So protein quality absolutely matters, and, and I'll show you. Oh, cricket protein, you need about 55 grams to, to get three grams of, of leucine. So, so why is it important? And we can go through this pretty quickly. An important thing to remember, though, poor, you know, lower protein quality doesn't mean lower nutrition quality. We need to separate those two. But take this, for example. Bread uh, has a limited, uh, limited by the quantity of lysine, the amino acid. And worldwide, if you're on a vegetarian diet, lysine is the amino acid that you've got to look for the most. Uh, beans, pulses, not much methionine, maybe lacking tryptophan as well. Uh, soy, not much cysteine. Now, if you do the combination, you can get around it. So if you had uh, bread, lacking, but it's got a lot of methionine in it, add that to chickpeas, opposite, plenty of lysine, not much methionine. You've got hummus, chickpea dip. So you can get a full complement of the essential amino acids, but there's a quantity issue that was, was touched upon earlier. To get the, the leucine and the total amino acid that's consistent with you know, uh, lean beef, about 30 grams of lean beef, you'd need to have about four cans of chickpeas and probably four or five slices of bread. Now, chickpeas, and, and, and uh, that, that's fabulous on several levels, but it's not the most efficient protein delivery vehicle, and it's not a one-for-one -one exchange on, on protein. Okay, use them for what they deliver, not the potential promise of something that they fundamentally can't. Okay, uh, and, and uh, hopefully Eleanor will touch upon this. Plant-based diets for most of us, there's a lot of wiggle room. One area though where it can make a big difference is if someone is consuming a single source protein supplement. So clinically, or if you're say breakfast skipping or using a, a protein supplement as a meal replacement, if you go with most of the high-quality protein supplements, whey, casein, soy, the, the, the blends, milk protein, full complement of the essential amino acids, you can get by with you know, a relatively small practical amount. If you're going to use some of these, these newer proteins, picking on, on collagen again, they don't deliver all the amino acids. They don't give you the same response. So don't be tricked into thinking, okay, I can substitute collagen for, for whey protein and, and have a, an anabolic benefit. It's not the same thing. You know, like I said, collagen doesn't have tryptophan. So if you combine it with turkey at Thanksgiving, maybe you can make up for that, but it's not a one-to-one. -one. It's not a great standalone option. I said that. 
Okay, let's wrap up. Now, we can get really complicated and, and specific about uh, details. You know, how much leucine, what's it effects on, on mTOR, how about the timing before and after exercise, that, those types of things. But for most people that we're working with, I think it's better to start with the broader picture and then backfill the details as, as they need to hear them. And I think a, a good starting point for just about all of us is to try and establish this dietary framework that contains a, a moderate amount, moderate, varies of high quality proteins or a mixture three times a day. Start with that and then modify it. We're not all the same. You know, 30 grams of protein for a, some, a frail older adult is ridiculous. But don't just ignore it and go for tea and toast. That's the absurd. A moderate amount means different things for everyone. And as we've heard repeatedly, absolutely no harm going higher so long as you're not exceeding your energy requirements by a massive amount you're going to be fine. But yet, yeah, modify this depending on your energy requirements, your body composition goals, satiety issues, dentition, things like that. Now, the area that I think we can have uh, the, perhaps the most impactful benefit in, in aging or clinical populations, if, if we can react aggressively to develop that nutrition framework to try and slow down that, that catastrophic loss of muscle that happens in three or four days, of physical inactivity. Slow that down, provide that, that leucine protein infrastructure, support it with activity or drugs where appropriate. Slow that down, give them more raw material to work with during recovery. I think we can dramatically impact health. It's a short period of time. We're going to feed them anyway. Uh, so the economic and resources needed is not that great and we can have a big impact. With that, this is my, my team. Thanks very much.